we will begin with a prayer. So if you can join me, I'll uh, open with prayer. Our loving, gracious Father, we are so grateful that once again we can come back. Though we are in various parts of uh, the country and, and the world, we just thank you, Lord, that you can you give us this opportunity to come on a platform like this to learn, to discuss, and uh, to be able to also to be able to renew our, our connection, our relationship. Thank you so much for your uh, provision for us in a difficult world. You, Father, you are looking after us uh, with our needs, and especially remember those who may have special uh, financial or uh, health needs or uh, other relational needs. We pray that, Lord, your mercies are upon them and your provision upon them. As Father, we begin this study together. We ask for your guidance uh, that you will help us to continue to grow, not only in knowledge, but in the faith that you've called us in. We come at this time into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. There was some echo there, but uh, welcome again. Uh, good to see Manoa has just joined us, Doris. And let me see, Om Prakash has also joined us. Uh, welcome. And Pauline, yes. And welcome to all of you. Today, I want to get back to the, the series that was started some time back, and uh, it's a bit slow going. We have covered, I would think, almost 13 to 1400 years of uh, church history, uh, and we still have a ways to go. And as we come to the you know, 1500s, 1600s, of course, we have the Reformation and so many other things to talk about, which we will get to in a while. But I was, um, before we get to the Reformation, I wanted to go to this particular subject, which I have already posted on the group, Christian mission versus colonialism. Let me just get the, my screen uh, for you to follow along. Give me a moment as I do that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm presuming you can see my screen. Very good, yes. So uh, I wanted to discuss this particular subject because colonialism has been uh, a reality uh, in the later part after 1300s and 1400s. And the larger question I want to ask is when we get to it, was it right to use colonialism to Christianize various nations, of course, Christianize the world. And so uh, we will, uh, I will be happy to hear some of your thoughts as we get into that. But as we uh, start, you know, Christianity started back, uh, you know, 2000 years back. And in those early years, the primary way Christianity spread was through the preaching of the gospel, all right? Um, the, the gospel was preached uh, by the early apostles, by the early church. And uh, let me just read you a scripture from Acts chapter six. Uh, and reading in verse 7, it's not on your screen, but I'll read it for you. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So even in those times, the word of God was going out quite powerfully through the preachings that the apostles and the early Christians indulged in, right? Uh, the famous, uh, uh, what do you call it, incident when the apostle Peter preached. And let me just read also that verse, just for us to put the context in terms of how the word, how Christianity spread in those times. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, it says, with many other words, he warned them, this is Peter, and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, 
and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So there was, you could say, uh, at least in the early years, an exponential increase through the preachings of the word of God. And of course, uh, uh, the, the whole, uh, you know, the Christianity was uh, within, you know, spreading within the Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman Empire facilitated the spread, right? And by 380, that is almost 250, 260 years after Jesus, 10% uh, of Rome had become Christian. Uh, that is a Roman Empire, you know. So that was uh, quite, quite a feat in terms of, pre uh, of uh, preaching the word of God through persecutions, all of that, the you know, the, uh, what do you say, the uh, Christian population increased to 10% of, of uh, the Roman Empire. And uh, trade, migrations, uh, uh, you know, all facilitated uh, the increase uh, of people adhering to the faith. Uh, Christianity at that time, remember we discussed that, came to India, it went to Africa, it went to Europe uh, by the migrations of various people. And of course, uh, with the Pax Romana that, uh, uh, that existed at that time, the relative peace that existed at, existed at that time, people were able to travel and take the message to various parts. Of course, 320, 300 and, um, well, somewhere in the early 300s, Constantine came on the throne and of course, uh, he declared Christianity as the official religion of uh, the empire. Now, once it was declared as an official religion of the empire, obviously, you know, uh, there was, uh, you know, a greater, uh, you know, you could say impetus for the, for the religion to spread because of the Roman might at that time. But I want to show you a map right now. Let me just see if I can get to that. I yeah, hope you can see this. It may be a bit small on your screen. But this is the time. I, I, I picked up this map just to show how Christianity spread. And this is up to 600 AD. But if you see the darker portion in the purple, those were the areas by 380, that is before Constantine, Christianity began to spread. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I'm, this is where, this is Jerusalem. And this is where, from where the, uh, from where Christianity started spreading all the way up here uh, into the, of course, modern day Turkey. And this was all of the part of the Roman empire. Uh, and here was Philippi. And then, of course, it went to Europe. You can see these little uh, dark shaded parts, which was uh, Christianity within 300 years of its uh, establishment. Right down here is Africa. So Egypt and Africa. And of course, uh, Christianity spread even there. I was mentioning to you about the Pax Romana, which is uh, uh, translated the Roman peace. Uh, it was, it lasted for about 200 years, and it was an era of comparative uh, tranquility. And because of that, migrations and travel took place and the word of God spread. So this is how Christianity spread in the early years. Of course, we have the Roman Empire, and of course, uh, and then uh, a number of years passes, passes by a whole a century, you know, not centuries passed by. We come now to what we call the colonial period, beginning in the 15th century, 1400s and, you know, something. The colonial period began. Um, this, the colonial period began with what we call is the, 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 the age of discovery. This was the beginning of the age of discovery, which mean to say this was the time when explorations took place, people started discovering new lands. That is why it is called the age of discovery. Uh, new sea routes, 
and discovery of the new world, as it is called, the new world, which are basically the Americas, but of course, Africa. And um, uh, of course, I must mention, when we talk about the age of discovery, uh, if, you, if you talk about the age of discovery to somebody like, like a, native, uh, a Native American, uh, they'll say, you know, we were already here. <laughs> So what's the question of discovering? So the question of discovering doesn't arise, but the Europeans called it the age of discovery. All right, so we'll go by that. But of course, we respect what the native Indians would say, the native Americans would say that uh, you are not discovering something, you are actually coming and stealing what was already discovered, right? So, but, this was the time where, you know, uh, the European empires began to uh, send ships and people to these various uh, places. Uh, European powers, uh, the, the, the kingship, the monarchy encouraged uh, the, and approved the takeover of the new world. They believed that uh, they had the mandate to come and take over the new world. And we need to know what was that mandate. To morally justify, you know, such ventures, they called it, or later it was called the white man's burden, which mean to say they believed, the European powers at that time believed that they were mandated to take civilization, Christianity, and commerce, as you see it on your screen, it is called the three C's. This was the motivating factor for them to begin to conquer new, these so-called new lands that they discovered. Uh, this word white man's uh, burden was actually popularized by Rudyard Kipling, if you remember him, uh, the poet. And uh, uh, let me see. In his poet, he, in, in his, he believed that um, the white people were supposed to go and conquer all of these lands. Uh, let me just read to you what I have read from history. It says it was Kipling's belief that Africa's must be pulled toward the light in order to see the error of their ways. And what was the error of their ways? In his view, it was their savage nature. So they believed and he wanted people to believe that these were all savages and the white man had the privilege and the prerogative to go and change that nature and bring civilization and Christianity to them. So the people of uh, the Americas, the indigenous people of the Americas, as well as the, of Africa, were considered culturally, culturally inferior. And they had many theories to support that. Unfortunately, they even used the Bible to support that. All right. So with these thoughts or with this uh, frame of mind, the colonial period began the colonization period by beginning with Spain, France, Portugal, uh, you know, and what, and they started missions. They started, uh, you know, uh, sending ships with soldiers to go and uh, colonize these new these uh, new places. Uh, and what was the motive? To civilize and to Christianize indigenous peoples of the Americas and Africa. The, the early uh, colonizers were also called the Spanish term conquistadors, uh, which can also mean conquerors uh, in, in Spanish, uh, conquistadors. And if I can read to you from history, it says the conquistadors were the explorer soldiers of the Spanish and Portuguese empires of the 15th and 16th centuries. During the age of discovery, conquistadors sailed beyond Europe to the Americas, Oceania, Africa, and Asia, colonizing and opening trade routes. 
along with all of these, uh, I mean, uh, along with the monarchy uh, encouraging such ventures, uh, missionaries, you know, went, went together with the soldier. The military and the missionaries went together. And who decreed some of these things? Who actually authorized some of this? It was decreed by the Vatican to convert indigenous, the indigenous people to Catholicism. And so this was the mindset of uh, the church at that time, uh, encouraging colonization of these, uh, of these places. And of course, uh, the French Jesuit missions were established in North America, Japan, and uh, uh, let me just mention a few more. All of these uh, places, you know, we had all of these missions uh, uh, established. Uh, the Portuguese mission to Goa right, is very familiar for us here in India, right? Uh, uh, once again, let me read to you parts of history. Missionaries of various religious orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Jesuits, the Augustinians were sent from Portugal to Goa with the goal of fulfilling the papal bull. You know, the papal bull is, a, um, uh, is an order by the papal authorities, uh, which, is, which they also call the Romanus Pontifex, right? Uh, so this is the official uh, order by the Vatican, which granted the patronage of the propagation of the Christian faith in Asia to the Portuguese. And what did they, what was their mandate? To promote assimilation of the native Goans with the Portuguese people. The Portuguese authorities in Goa supported these missionaries as it is written in the uh, Christianization of the Goa, a book written by uh, one Mr. Anthony de Costa. So uh, Portuguese missions uh, in Goa is very familiar to us here in India. Uh, and there is no doubts about the fact that they used force, they resorted to slaughter, and they also resorted to the destruction of temples. And those are all, I think, quite well documented in history. Uh, we also had the Goan Inquisition, as it is called, was an extension of the Portuguese Inquisition uh, to enforce Catholic orthodoxy amongst the, you know, to, amongst the people. They wanted people to remain, uh, to give their allegiance to the Pope. And so uh, the, uh, the Goan Inquisition was established, okay? Then, of course, uh, the colonial rule in Africa is very well known for, for all of us through history. France, Britain, Germany, all of them came, took a slice of Africa. Uh, even before that, you had uh, Northern Europeans coming to South Africa. And, uh, and then, of course, you know the whole history of South Africa with the apartheid and, uh, and of course, the conquering of those parts. Uh, that took place. Then, of course, the Spaniards went to the Philippines, and I was surprised to know that the Spaniards, uh, you know, uh, colonized the Philippines for about 400 years, I think it was. And so um, uh, it was quite surprising for me to learn that, um, just reading history. And so they were there for quite some time, and that's the reason why Catholicism is uh, quite widely practiced in the Philippines. And uh, just to mention that uh, we were there uh, last year for the conference and we went to a place called the Intramuros, which is a settlement of the Spaniards uh, in the, on the outskirts of Manila. And so I wanted to show you a picture of that. You know, GCI and at the Intramuros, uh, may I tell you that we were only tourists, not conquistadors. <laughs> so we were, we were there only as tourists. You can see Dr. Greg Williams there. 
and uh, myself, and then of course, uh, some of our Asian pastors. Uh, this was the uh, conference that we had in uh, October of last year. So uh, we went to, the, to this walled city, the settlement of the Spaniards, and we looked at, uh, you know, which was actually built in 1571. How many years back is that? Wow, I mean, uh, quite, quite some time back. Uh, 1571, the Spaniards settled there. Uh, and uh, uh, th there was a, a complete settlement of, of the Spaniards uh, in, that, in that place. So you can see how colonialism took Christianity to these all of these various places. And what was the... Uh, you could say presence of Christianity after colonialism. And once again, I wanted to show you a map. Uh, you've seen the map earlier. Now look at this map. All the, the dark, is it the dark blue or dark purple? Or, or, <laughs> uh, I, I, let's call it dark purple. All the dark purple is uh, Christian, you could say Christian uh, presence or Christian nations, uh, whatever you might call it. You see the green there, that is Islam, uh, the nations where Islam is, uh, uh, you know, mostly uh, present and prevalent. You could also see uh, Hinduism in India and some parts, Buddhism in the red. But look at what happened after colonialism, uh, the spread of Christianity, and if you compare it with the previous map, it was centered around, of course, uh, Jerusalem and a little bit of Africa and Europe. Okay, moving on. What were the methods used by the, col the colonizers? Uh, and of course, their, uh, their main aim was to conquer and to plunder. Uh, but what about how was Christianity spread? And that is what I want to focus a little bit more on. There is no doubts about the fact that they, it was often by the use of force and the use of violence. All right. Uh, there was, uh, they were, people were forced into, the, into Christianity. And of course, the colonizers made themselves wealthy, plundered the wealth of uh, the, uh, the local people, uh, the conquistadors took over the Aztec kingdoms, the Inca, the, the, the Incas were other natives of the Americas, the native Indians in North America systematically slaughtered. We know that, you know, how the, the local uh, indigenous Indian uh, people uh, of the Americas uh, were, uh, you know, really slaughtered. And we also know of the slave trade in Africa and all of these things uh, are very well documented. They believed in what they called as the blood and iron policy, which basically meant the sp spilling of blood and the use of military force, iron, uh, you know, so swords and spears. And some would actually like to call it blood and gold policy because they literally plundered them and they actually were told that there is lots of gold to be found in the Americas. And so people were flocking to the Americas to find the gold, right? And so there was a widespread enslavement of the indigenous people. And while they settled down there, they also introduced disease, uh, various kinds of disease that never existed in those places were introduced by the, uh, you know, by the colonizers. And all in the name of Christianity. And that is uh, uh, an unfortunate uh, development. And because of this, I was watching some commentators saying that Christianity and the Christians of that time believed in supremacy and exclusivism and they said that this supremacy and this exclusivism was sanctioned in the Bible. Uh, they specifically quote the Old Testament records of plunder and uh, slaughter. 
and they believe that the Old Testament sanctioned the uh, takeover as well as the slaughter of the local people. Hence, they believe that the same legacy continues uh, continued during the colonial period. And of course, some of these commentators always like to disprove the Bible and they would like to say that the scriptures indeed are flawed. But on the brighter side, uh, thankfully, there were some missionaries who respected the indigenous people. And we have records of the many who were sacrificial in the way they treated these people and the way they, uh, you could say, uplifted them, you know, especially the, some of the uh, Catholic fathers, Catholic priests, and some of the Protestant uh, missions, missionaries, they recognized the dignity of these people, restored their dignity. They uh, certainly recognized the, their human rights, you could say, and they actively opposed the oppression that was brought by the military side, the, the secular side. We do know that colonialism also promoted education. The preservation of the local language by translations. You know, the Bible was translated in many of those local languages. And so, um, uh, so to some extent, thankfully, there were enough Christians who let the light of uh, Jesus shine in, 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 even in spite of the tremendous destruction that took place. Uh, talking about some of those who respected the indigenous people, uh, I must mention, I was reading of one father, Bartholomew Casas, uh, who, who's, who wrote uh, uh, an article called A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies. That's the article that he wrote. And he documented its wrenching description of the atrocities Europeans perpetrated against the native peoples. And this was translated. And of course, it reached Europe. And apparently at that time, the kings and the queens of that time uh, took a more humane view and specifically told the uh, conquering people to treat the indigenous people kindly. And so, uh, so thankfully there were people like this who took up the cause of the indigenous people. Uh, one of the things that, you know, you could say the uh, colonialism brought was bringing democracy, you could say to some extent or democratic roots of uh, governance, uh, which I would say gave rise to secularism and I would like to specifically mention this because I live in a country, you know, many of us, all of us live in this country where I think we value secularism and secularism is what gives us religious freedom, right? I value that. And uh, because if, if we didn't have that sense of freedom, uh, we would not be able to practice our religion. And so to that extent, I'm grateful for the democratic roots of our country here in India, as well as the secularism that we continue to uphold uh, in, in our country, which gives us a sense of freedom, even though they, some people would believe that it is tremendously under attack. Okay, so um, this is in brief, once again, there is so much material on this that, uh, it's very difficult to bring in all of it. And I must say that the debate is vicious. The debate on the pros and cons of colonialism is indeed extremely severe. You could have many people uh, trying to justify colonialism, but on the other hand, many, many others who, do, who look at colonialism as a curse uh, you know, upon the indigenous people. Uh, you, I don't know, but you, you may have heard the long one hour speech of uh, Sashi Tharoor, one of our politicians here, who uh, documented 
the you know how india was degraded by the british rule uh, the british colonial rule in uh, in our country and so uh, he demands an apology from them so having said all of that let's uh, get into some uh, let me see uh, some reflection now all right um, well how do we reflect on this period of time where we call the colonial period. Of course, we know Christianity spread, but today as disciples of Jesus, uh, how do we look at that time, right? Uh, can we accept the fact that errors were committed by, by religious, you know, I mean, Christians? And do we have the courage to acknowledge those errors? And not only acknowledge those errors, but repent of, uh, you know, um, of those uh, uh, terrible mistakes that were made in the name of religion. Uh, I'm just noticing that my video is off. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that, you know, in a moment. You know, the fact that... Uh, some of these people use the Bible to justify the indigenous people as inferior, as savages, as uncivilized, is a naked, you know, uh, acknowledgement to racism. I mean, uh, there was no doubts about the fact that there was very heavy racist thinking and tendencies and beliefs uh, that drove some of these people to do what they did. And I think we must acknowledge them. And I notice I, I put Pope Francis there. And recently, I just want to read to you what I read about Pope Francis. I think he has had the courage to say something which probably nobody has. Uh, let me read, I'm reading. It says, Pope Francis, a Jesuit, has frequently criticized the colonialism and neo-colonialism of the Christian nations of the global north, referring to colonialism as a blasphemy against God and saying that many grave sins were committed against the native peoples of, the, of America in the name of God. And so that is a very powerful uh, indictment uh, that he gives. I mean, he is uh, probably the you know, he is the head of probably the largest Christian denomination. And for him to say that is, uh, it does take some courage. Uh, let me just see. Yeah, okay. I noticed that my video was off, so I brought it back. Um, so I think we must be willing to acknowledge the fact that there was the uh, unfortunate uh, misinterpretation of the Bible to make people to think that the indigenous people of the Americas and, the, and Africa were inferior, savage, and uncivilized. And to that extent, we must acknowledge the errors of those people uh, and repent. And talking about repentance, I was just reading by uh, reading a, uh, a part of a book uh, titled Find, uh, Post Colonial Theology, Finding God and Each Other Amidst the Hate, the hate uh, written by Robert Heaney. And he says, ecclesiastical repentance, that is, repentance as a church, as a, as a denomination, as denominations, right? He says, ecclesiastical repentance is not about optics, is not about broadcasting a better message to society. It's not about managing a problem. It is not about progressive politics. It's not even about guilt for a community's sin. It is about being humbled by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is moving amongst us and helping us recognize that uh, uh, Christianity had gone wrong. There was misinterpretation of the scriptures and uh, uh, we need to acknowledge that and you know recognize that i also wanted to mention in our reflection uh, 
Uh, let me just see. Okay. Uh, this, the, 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 the third part or the third point, mission work versus colonialism, right? Mission work is, I think we must be uh, careful not to equal it to colonialism, right? Uh, once again, reading from uh, my research, it says Christians can justify biblical missions on the basis of the word of God. However, colonialism cannot be justified by Christians. A definition of colonialism can be the following. Colonialism is a practice of domination, which involves the subjugation of one people to another. This is taken from the Stanford Encyclopedia of philosophy. So if colonialism is domination involving subjugation, that is not what Christianity is. And that should never be what mission work is. And so, uh, uh, you know, colonialism is not the same as true biblical mission work. And that is something that we must uh, recognize, you know. The great commission given by Jesus Christ is to go and preach the gospel. It was not supposed to be forced down the throats of people. It was not to change the culture of indigenous people. Uh, it was uh, the, the gospel is the very heart of Jesus Christ. He said, make disciples, not change culture, right? Within the indigenous culture, people can still be Christians. And that is something that perhaps uh, colonizers didn't fully recognize. And finally, my last part, theology matters. And I think uh, more than anybody else, we in our denomination recognize that theology matters. How we, how we understand the scriptures, how we understand the Bible, how we teach the Bible, is a matter of great importance because the way we teach influences people and people live their lives based on those interpretations. And uh, uh, through our reformation, we could see that some of our interpretations could very uh, wrongly influence people and bring great deal of suffering. And so to that extent, uh, you know, one of the very powerful lessons we learn is that the way we interpret scripture are the theology that we adopt and we glean from the scriptures is vitally important. And uh, we hope that we can, you know, uh, make all the course corrections. And thankfully, I think it's being done, even though sometimes we see the ugly head of uh, colonialism raising uh, from time to time. Okay, so I'm going to stop there um, and uh, leave it open now for some thoughts and reflections that you might have. Uh, like I said, uh, this is just a snapshot of the colonial period. Uh, there is lots of debate going on with regards to colonialism and uh, many of it is very, very negative, but I think as disciples of Jesus, as a denomination, as Christians, we must be willing to acknowledge where we may have, uh, you know, acknowledge the, the mistakes of uh, our, you know, predecessors. Okay, open to some thoughts. Is there anything you'd like to add to what I'd like? And maybe you have some information, some thoughts uh, that you'd like to add. Please feel free to do so. And welcome to Franklin. I'm not sure if you just joined or if you uh, you were there earlier. No, sir. I, I'm there, sir. But okay. I joined you about 10 minutes late. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, good to see you. Well, uh, Franklin, you being uh, one of those apologists and historians, <laughs> maybe you have something to add. Uh, sir, uh, my initial comment, sir, you called a spade a spade. Uh, congrats. I mean, we have the honesty and the courage, sir, to accept na, the errors committed in the name of Christianity. Na? And then I'll come back to you, sir. Let others have a chance. Okay. I'll come back to you. Right. Yes. Was Bertie, were, were, you, were you wanting to say something? No, Mr. Zakarai. Okay, okay. I thought you had. Or was it Anil? I thought I saw a hand going up. <laughs> right. 
Okay, yeah, give me some thoughts. <laughs> I think uh, there's a common misconception that, uh, you know, colonialism is equated with the uh, spread of Christianity. Uh, although that may have been uh, unintended positive uh, effect of colonialism, but it was never the main thing. You rightly said colonialism was basically for domination and plunder and to make oneself rich. And uh, of course, some of the missionaries had a heart for the locals, so they, you know, as you said, they defended them. And But otherwise, colonialism can never be justified on any ground. Uh, you're right, Anil. I, I think uh, we, we should not make the mistake of equating colonialism with Christianity. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, it, the, 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 what do you say, to send missionaries with the soldiers yeah. was, uh, you know, decreed by the Pope, the very head of the church. Yeah. And even I would think even the, 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 the monarch of England, the monarchy of England, you know, said that they can go, you know, and uh, bring Christianity to these uncivilized people. And so that is where I think, uh, unfortunately, yes. colonialism got mixed up with Christianity. Yeah, one of the powers that I, 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 maybe you mentioned that, but I didn't see it, is Belgium. They, they are also very big colonizers, especially in the Congo and so on, where they committed such atrocities. Right. It's unbelievable. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But on the, uh, one question I have, do you think Christianity would have spread as it did or as fast as it did without col col colonization or colonialism? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a million dollar question. Um, yeah. I, uh, of course, we really can't say, uh, but if <clears throat> God meant for the gospel to go to the nations, uh, I don't know if uh, he could have done it another way. Uh, colonialism, of course, brought Christianity to, to much of the world, but um, uh, uh, if it went, in, went out in the first 300 years, if it went out 10% of, of the Roman Empire, uh, I'm, I'm presuming that God would have found a way to take the gospel around the nations. Right? Any Correct. thoughts? Any, anybody can offer any thoughts on that? <laughs> but as usual, man took it upon himself to do it his way to spread the Christianity rather than, you know, use God's way or wait for God to direct him. And yes, and that is biblical, isn't it? What did Abraham yeah. do? He was not patient enough to wait for the, the uh, promised heir <laughs> and decided yeah. to, you know, to do it his own way. So it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if it was done God's way, if whether we would have had the Middle East problem as it is, exists today. I don't know. Mm. Uh, once again, by, through hindsight, you know, difficult to say. Yeah. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Colonialism, uh, although we have uh, uh, just spoke, uh, mentioned about the history and how they sort of subjugated the people and, uh, and uh, you know, dominated them and uh, some atrocities yeah. were committed, and the missionaries and, you know, converted them to the point, uh, you know, uh, to Christianity. But uh, don't you think we also have benefited, like, you know, um, the British... Um, are in our very country, the British who were colonists and uh, over a period of time and even uh, the Portuguese and all, uh, we have uh, benefited by way of the language, we have benefited by way of uh, a lot of, you know, infrastructure. 
infrastructure no. and other things. No. My properties were benefited uh, by, uh, by, you know, by the colonists uh, for whatever period. Of course, uh, the atrocities and, you know, the way they, the way they went about doing things and, um, and the conversion. Um, right. Right. Yeah, uh, uh, um, the conversion should be a proper conversion of the heart, as we know of now. Yeah, but that's a very that's a very interesting point, Bertie. Benefits, yeah, we have the benefits of infrastructure. All this rail system here, you know, the railways, you know, yeah. Indian railways, and even the English language and schools and colleges uh, have a beginning, you know, uh, okay. all, uh, days of the co colonizations. Yes, interesting point. In fact, I was uh, listening to a debate on this, and uh, you know, somebody said that, uh, and 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 and, and uh, they specifically mentioned railways here in India, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. and in Africa, I guess, uh, to some extent. Uh, and they said uh, uh, one of the views was that the British or anybody did not build the railways for our benefit. Correct. Shashi Tharoor mentioned in his lecture. Okay, all right. Yeah, he probably did. They built the railways for themselves. It was just a byproduct of, you know, uh, f f that we inherited it. In fact, some people try to think that, you know, what great benefits in terms of, color, uh, you know, these colonial people did. A nation like Ethiopia or some, uh, one or two countries, I think, in Africa that were not colonized, they said, we wish we were colonized <laughs> so that we could have the railways and all of that stuff. But on the other hand, the amount of plunder that took place and mm -hmm. impoverishment of, na of the nations, and of course, uh, literal, uh, you know, disappearance of uh, vast peoples like uh, the indigenous peoples of the Americas, uh, that was very, very unfortunate. The slavery that took place in Africa. I mean, uh, the question is, can we justify the benefits with the vast amount of plunder that took place and the tremendous amount of suffering that colonialism brought. Well, that's a, a once again open up for, open for discussion, you know, for debate. Yes, Bertie. Another, another, do you think we benefited from them, from the colonists, by way of good governance from the government point of view, you know, gov governing? Yes. Good. Uh, did we, did we have, did we, uh, what do you say in our own country or elsewhere? Uh, besides the you know the negatives we have mentioned, you, uh, just, yes, we don't but, approve. And, you know, but what about the uh, you know it's, uh, in the benefits about uh, good governance? Do you do you feel we uh, we we in India benefited and other countries as well? Well, like I said, I mean one of the things I would like to acknowledge is uh, democratic roots and secularism, which I feel is precious for us who are minorities in this land. We are given the privilege on the, and the opportunity to worship and to have our own religion. But uh, I mean, once again, I don't know. Uh, if we had, if we didn't have colonization, I don't know what India would be. Would it be a princely state? We would be live, would we be living under the Nizam? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, but yes, I think we can definitely say that. Uh, some bit of uh, good governance. Uh, as I would say that democracy, even though it is not certainly the best, uh, uh, you know, to some extent has been a, uh, a blessing for us. Anybody have a counterpoint on that? I think Franklin is raring to go. Go ahead, Franklin. Uh, sir, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I think, sir, it was Winston Churchill who said, democracy is the worst form of government. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think uh, it's I, a, sir, I, I'm coming up with a, with a study on democracy. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the democracy is foundational worldview. Uh, I will submit the script to you, sir, a draft script. Okay. But if, if it is the worst form, do you have an alternative? Uh, no, sir. Uh, the, what, sir. What did they say, sir? The, the, among the evils, the, the least of the evil. Democracy is, is an evil, but it's the least of the evil. Right. That's the better form. That's it. uh, it's the, le it's the sir, least yes, of the evil uh, form of government. I want to do a presentation, sir, but I'll give you my script first. So it is uh, It is the best among the worst. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Precisely. Okay. Yeah. Right. So can I Demonocracy. Yeah. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, all finished? All finished speaking? 
Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, I wouldn't like to take away their time. Sir, uh, this uh, military and mission, sir, it's an unholy alliance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, real, you realize then, now, Franklin? <laughs> and then, sir, you spoke about blood and iron policy, which is blatantly uh, anti-biblical, sir. Mm. As I said, no, sir, I'm wondering how did the Vatican uh, approve and how did the British people approve it? But uh, the use of force also, sir, I think Christians are very clear, sir. Uh, the force cannot be used. Uh, the use of force sir, takes us to a new subject, sir. Means and ends. Does the means justify the end? Or does the end justify the means? It's, we can have a full-length uh, discussion on that subject. Yeah. And then, sir, you but talk as about you said, this. Sorry, uh, as you said, uh, they justify the Old Testament to... to uh, I mean, they quote the Old Testament to justify violence. No, sir, I'm saying it opens up a new subject, means and ends. Does the means justify the ends or does the end justify the means? Well, yes, I mean, uh, once again, that's uh, debatable. And uh, from a biblical perspective, I think we should be clear. Yeah. Anil mentioned about the Old Testament and lots of people have used that to disprove the Bible, to say that the Bible is a violent book. But one thing I would like to submit with regards to the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the mandate that God gave Israel when they went into the promised land, especially the, you know, the land of Canaan. Uh, there was a clear mandate to rid the land of the local people. But the mandate was specific to time and place. It was not a worldwide mandate. It was never a mandate for Israel to go and conquer the whole world and displace everybody. So the question is, why would God tell the nation of Israel to go and clear out the land of the Canaanites? And there are once again many theories about that. But one of the theories I've heard is that the Canaanites were inhabited by giants. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 6, <coughs> Yeah, you have the angels cohabiting with uh, humans. And I think that was against God's, you know, uh, way of having human beings uh, come into uh, his, you know, planned purpose. And these giants lived in those places and God wanted them rid. At least that is one of the ways it's explained. But I must say that... That was a specific mandate for a specific time, for a specific place, not something for all times, for all people. And so Christians cannot use that, unfortunately, to justify any kind of violence against people when they go and preach the gospel. Correct. Yes, Franklin. Yes, sir, you, you spoke about uh, during the, uh, what he calls a colonial period, there were several linings. There were a few individuals, sir, uh, who did a, a fantastic job. Uh, and then you, you mentioned uh, a few. Yeah. But I have one more name, sir. Uh, I, I recall uh, Mr. Graham Staines. Uh, this man, sir, preached Christianity uh, without uh, trying to benefit either for himself or for his organization. He just gave mm -hmm. service. Well, yeah. Stains in Orissa. Yeah, Stains yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, he, he worked among the lepers. Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. he was uh, un very unfortunate. Very yes. right. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, such people ought to be lauded because they did tremendous work amongst indigenous people. They never disrespected any one of them. Uh, one word, one name, I think we have mentioned uh, before also David Livingston, who brought, mm -hmm. uh, you know, medicine and medical uh, knowledge to Africa. Uh, he, he was, he respected the African people tremendously. Uh, he did not exploit them <laughs> like the others did. So yeah, there are some names that uh, stand out. Yes, sir. There is a name of an African, no, sir, who was buried in Africa. His heart was buried. Uh, philanthropist, one of the greatest philanthropists. Livingston, pardon? I think you are talking about Livingston, who was a doctor. Yeah, yeah Livingston. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah. 
Well, time is going by. Uh, maybe just a few minutes left. But any any thoughts on um, you know the uh, the comment I made regarding uh, biblical interpretation and theology and how we must be careful how we interpret the scriptures. Yes, Bertie, you had a thought. Uh, we we recognize that we're living in a fallen world and. Uh, you know, sin brings about violence and other things. God, of course, is all knowing in his plan. Would you say that colonization uh, and, you know, all the account that we hear, we, we hear, you know, about and the silver linings and the benefits and uh, other conversion that took place at the point of, uh, of uh, you know, of, uh, done at the point or, or whatever, was it in God's, uh, would you say it is part of, was it part of the uh, God's plan as such? I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying, I, I don't know. I, would it be part of God's plan to like, you know, like India, uh, the colonists who came to India and other places, was it part of God's plan as such? Uh, in his overall, <laughs> overall plan, you know, everything goes, he is sovereign Lord. And would you say that uh, he permitted it or could have done some other way? Was it in this plan? You're asking me to read God's mind, which I can't do, Bertie. <laughs> I don't, I cannot find anywhere in scripture where I can justify violence. God is, uh, is light. In him is no darkness. In other words, there is no evil in God. God is not the author of evil. So we cannot justify the, uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the tremendous suffering that people have brought upon themselves and say that it was God's plan. We have to be careful. Correct. We don't say that. <laughs> I think God uses those, just despite man's action, God uses those to ultimately fulfill his purpose. Yes, yes. 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 That's a better way to say it. Yes. Even yes. though man messes up, he can still work in that mess. So, Correct. So we are grateful for that. All right, I think uh, Paulina. Pauline, do you have a thought? I notice a hand going up. Okay. Yeah, I want to just add to uh, all of uh, what we discuss, and uh, my way, my perception on this is: um, first of all, good evening, uh, everybody, Pastor Dan, and everybody. Yeah, my perception is: uh, see, not for nothing that uh, Christianity is spread all over the world, you know, if there were no benefits which are overweighing the negative part of it, you know, all over the world, the Christianity. Now, what human nature is, we concentrate. Mm -hmm. Rather, we magnify all the negative part. Okay. So mm -hmm. I think the entire universe, world, globe is not blind of the it's, it had become, uh, at a certain stage, the colonism, a way of life. Because the life here was, you know, as we all discussed, the uh, language that had made you, you know, explore uh, the unexplored trade. The only um, uh, thing was, uh, in India, it was a very rich country. And it is but human that, uh, you know, to plunder was the main aim. But then uh, what I feel is people have resisted. Those times they have resi resisted. So it was called as, you know, forced, forced conversion. Today, when we have all the legal laws, everything, they still say, no, the Christianity is luring them, you know, with good thing. Now, all of us should accept the fact, in fact, be encouraged that we all need this communication, be it railways, be it the education and health. Um, you know, when health is today in the contemporary world is an ongoing, you know, it goes expose um, the medical fraternity exposes the what is and what is going to be, what is not. So uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, for no reason, um, you know, colonialism can be, if, if at all it has to be blamed, I guess uh, it will be a very uh, minuscule uh, percentage uh, to be blamed. Otherwise, we, today we wouldn't have been sitting and, uh, you know, even differentiate this. Because it is across the world. You can fool uh, or you can, you know, cheat or whatever the word you use. One, two, three. But not billions of people spread across because it is no other 
um, you know, faith as uh, expanded or existing. Yeah. In I fact, think, we uh, are coming to a time which is coming to atheism, but, uh, you know, this is not diminishing as such. I think what you're trying to say, Pauline, is if I can uh, put it in a nutshell, that uh, doesn't the positives outweigh the negatives? Perhaps that's what you're absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Now, that is a matter of perspective. You see, some people's perspective is that it is utterly negative. Uh, some people's perspective is, you know, there are a lot of positives. But we are looking at it from the perspective of the Bible. Does the Bible sanction violence and force and plunder? Uh, does the Bible sanction calling the indigenous people savages? I don't think, I mean, we have to be honest about that. And we must call a spade a spade, like Franklin said. In that respect, I think from a biblical perspective, some of the things that were done were no, unbiblical. So that is what we are probably trying to establish here. But the negatives and the positives are always a matter of perspective and the debate never ends. That, that's true. That's true, Pastor. While agreeing with uh, you that, uh, you know, there are no ifs and buts, but again, civilization. Over the period, civilization has increased. So I guess the violence See, is... Once again, Polly, yeah. if I can just interject... You're talking about civiliz civilization. Yeah, it was less that civilized. Means what you're saying civilized. is, what you're saying is that the indigenous people had no civilization, that they were they were not civilized, but they will beg to differ. They say that their civilization was much more advanced than Western civilization. That's what they say. So it's a matter of perspective, you know, how you look at it. The Indians would say that our ancient civilization is much greater, the Vedantic civilization is much greater than what it is today. So once again, matter of perspective. Right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, thanks for the thoughts. I think you had a very interesting point there. And uh, thank you very much. I think the time has gone by. And uh, uh, very grateful to you for joining us. And may I request Bertram, if you can... Close in prayer, Bertie. Please lead us. Thank you. Sure. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we are just thankful, Lord, and praise you and bless your name, Lord, your holy name, that you uh, bring, uh, bring about uh, such Bible studies, Lord. You make it possible for us to come together as your children, Lord, to be able to, uh, uh, to, uh, able to Lord, to discuss to have a Bible study, Lord, uh, uh, on the subjects of the Bible and uh, uh, different perspectives also are brought about. But uh, eventually, Lord, we know your word is right. Your word is truth and you are sovereign and you are holy and righteous God, Lord. And in Christ, Lord, you have brought us, restored us to fellowship and communion with you and have uh, also blessed us with participation in your mission, uh, which uh, your son has received from the Father, uh, uh, for the world and that we are uh, to live and share the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for Mr. Zechariah and the other pastors who, Lord, teach us and lead us and help us to get a better understanding and to grow in the grace and knowledge and then the faith of Jesus. So we thank you for this time together. We pray that, uh, Lord, uh, that you keep each one in your favor. Uh, your people and their families, that you bless them with their needs. You love them, care for them, help them, correct them, but in just measure, not in anger, lest you bring us to nothing. Teach us, Lord, and help us. And thank you for this time together. Bring us again, again, Lord, for worshiping our God and for Bible study, your word, Lord, that we may have it in our heart. We pray this prayer, Father God, and thank you so much, Lord, you, Lord, that you make it possible for us. We take it as a blessing, Lord, and we praise and thank you for it. We pray this prayer, Father, in Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining. God bless you. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye then.